the reflection on equanimity just now, focused on karma. Each of us is the owner of our karma. And if you don't understand the teaching on karma, it sounds kind of pes pessimistic and fatalistic. As people do their thing and we have our karma, we just have to put up with it. But actually it's pointing out what you have to put up with and what you don't have to put up with. Because that requires that you understand the teaching on karma. Because an important part of karma is our freedom of choice. What you're experiencing right now is a combination of three things. Choices you made in the past, sending their results into the present moment. And there are lots of those. And then there are the choices you're making right now, and the results of those choices. And your experience is the combination of all three. In fact, it's your present input that allows you to experience these things to begin with. And that right there points to, to where the freedom lies in your present choices. Because it turns out that not only are they the ones that you're free to choose, no matter how unskillful you've been in the past and how much bad karma you have in the past, you are free to choose the skillful course right now. And it turns out that if you can do that with skill, you don't have to suffer, because the suffering that weighs down the mind is not what comes from past actions. It it's what's coming from your actions right now. I mean, there will be pains in the body as a result of past actions, and a lot of tormenting thoughts may come up in the mind as a result of past actions, but you have the choice of how you're going to relate to those things. This is one of the reasons why we meditate, is to develop more skill in how to relate to things in a way that doesn't let us suffer. So the teaching on karma focuses you, focuses you on the present moment, having you look at what choices you actually have right now. Now one of the things you run up against immediately is that you've had some bad choices in the past and you still have the ability to make some bad choices now. That's part of having freedom of choice. And so it requires that we train ourselves to be more skillful in the present, and also to relate more skillfully to what's coming from the past. But the fact that we have freedom has another implication. Other people have freedom, too. They're free to choose what they're going to do and say and think. And just like we can make mistakes, they can make mistakes as well. And we have to live in a world where people are making a lot of mistakes. Now, to some extent, we can hope to influence both ourselves and other people to act in a skillful direction. But there are limits on how far we can force other people to behave skillfully. And you have to remember that, as that other part of the chant says, we're the owners of our actions, that your actions are your most important possession, which means that you don't want to do anything unskillful to prevent other people from doing unskillful things. This is one of the big problems in life. People see somebody else doing something bad, and they say, well, I've got to stop that, and they end up doing something really bad, too. And then they try to justify it. It's the old story about, well, if you know someone's going to kill X number of people, wouldn't it be better just to kill that person first? Well, you don't know if the other person's actually going to do that. But what you do know is that you've killed that person. So there's a limitation there. Other people may want to do something really unskillful, and there are boundaries of skillfulness for yourself that you don't want to overstep. In some cases, you have to accept the fact that you're going to be on the receiving end of their unskillful behavior, their unskillful choices. But remembering that your actions are your most important possession, you also realize that okay, they can hurt you in various ways. They can cause you physical pain. They can say nasty things to you. That's the part of you that's going to open to their influence automatically. 
But what they hurt you in those ways, it doesn't, they don't necessarily harm you. What they really harm you is they get you to do unskillful things in response. To make sure that that distinction is clear. They can hurt you physically, they can say nasty things, but they're not really harming you. It's only if you decide to retaliate in unskillful ways, okay, that's, when, that's when they've done harm and you've harmed yourself. So an important part of equanimity lies in learning patience, how to deal with unskillful words, how to deal with painful feelings. And the Buddha's recommendations on unskillful words basically that you learn how to depersonalize them. In one case he says, when someone's saying something really nasty, remind yourself that it only has to go as far as your ears. You tell yourself, okay, an unpleasant sound is making contact at the ears, and see if you can stop it there. Because if it goes in from there, it's not coming in on its own. You pulled it in. In other words, you start commenting on how awful that person was, and how can they possibly say that, and what a horrible thing it is to say, and is it really true? I hope it's not true. And all these other things, we just pull, pull, pull in all this nasty stuff. It's like a vacuum cleaner that pulls in all the dirt. So you can remind yourself, you're free to say, just leave it there at the ear. There's an unpleasant sound, has made contact at the ear, and when the contact ends, it's ended. Our problem, as the Buddha said, is like we're a gong that reverberates. A sound comes into the air and it reverberates throughout our mind. And it can go on for days and weeks and months and years, the things that other people have said. So you've got to train yourself to learn how to see it just as a sound at the ear and stop it right there. And be aware of any tendencies you have to add lots of narratives around that. And remind yourself that the fact that you have an ear is what leaves you open to hearing these things. So it's a normal part of human experience. That's the, other, that's the Buddha's other contemplation, as he talks about the different kinds of speech there are in the human world. There's kind speech and there's unkind speech. There's true speech and there's false speech. Helpful, harmful. In other words, all kinds of good and bad speech. And this is normalcy for human speech. So when someone's lying to you or saying something really nasty, something really hurtful, and you know that they have bad intentions behind that, just remind yourself, this is nothing out of the norm. We wanted to be born as human beings, and this is, this is what we get. And so we can realize that okay, this is the way human speech is everywhere. It makes it a lot easier to deal with it and not feel so singled out, because that's a lot of what our problems are, and the feeling that we've been singled out somehow for especially bad treatment. So you can depersonalize it and see it as something in a larger part of the world as a whole. It reminds you that you want to stay on in the human world, because this is what you're going to be subject to. It provides good motivation to meditate to see if there's, find if there's some way out. As for physical pain, the Buddha says on the one hand, if you can develop thoughts of goodwill to all beings, it helps to mitigate the pain. There's the case of the bandits who trap you and pin you down and are going to saw off your limbs with a saw. And he says, you even want to have goodwill for those bandits. Because if you don't, what's going to happen? You're going to think thoughts of revenge. And there you are, you've harmed yourself. So what equanimity teaches you here right now, if, if you've been pinned down, there's nothing you can do to fight, okay, you've got to accept that fact, and then you realize, okay, I've got to maintain the state of my mind. The Buddha says you want to look after your goodwill the same way that a mother would look after her only son. Protect it to that extent. Be careful with it. Be meticulous with it, even in really difficult situations. And the Buddha, of course, says the reason he gives you this analogy, it's a very extreme one, is that when other people say really nasty things, you can say, well, even if I'm supposed to have goodwill for people who pin me down and are just sawing off my limbs, 
maybe it's okay, maybe it's a lot easier to have goodwill for the person who's saying something nasty, saying something, something lying to you or, or really hurtful. So this is what the teaching on karma is all about, is to help you see there are some areas that you have to accept, but there are areas where you have freedom of choice right here in the present moment, all the time. So when we reflect on karma as a way of developing equanimity, it's not just passive or fatalistic. It's to remind us of what's important. Is our actions in the present moment, our freedom to choose wisely or unwisely in the present moment is what makes all the difference. The painful things in the world, the Buddha says, are like being shot by an arrow. But our problem is we don't leave it with just one arrow. We shoot ourselves with a lot more. You can imagine what it's like. Hold that picture in mind. You've been shot by an arrow, and then you take the trouble of picking up a bow and arrow and pointing them at yourself. Just the fact that you're pointing them at yourself right there, that makes the first arrow hurt even more. And then, of course, then the other arrows come in. But as he points out, it's those extra arrows that actually weigh down the mind. That first arrow does not have to weigh down the mind. If you develop the right qualities of mind, which he enumerates as one, the ability to develop unlimited goodwill, equanimity. Two, working on your virtue. So you don't have to criticize yourself over the unvirtuous things you've done or said. Working on your discernment so you can see these distinctions in karma. And then turning your mind so that it's not overcome by pleasure or overcome by pain. This is one of the reasons why we practice concentration. As we're working with the breath, it gives us a skill for handling physical pain that comes up. At the very least, we know how to focus on another part of the body and get the breath energy in that part of the body running well, so that it's soothing and nourishing and energizing. And then we can spread that sense of ease to the area where the pain is. Think of the breath energy flowing to the pain through the pain. In other words, it gives us a series of skills for dealing with pain so we're not just on the receiving end and feeling helpless with it. And that enables us to have a sense of confidence in the present moment so we can really do our duty with regard to pain, which is to comprehend it, to see what it is about the physical pain that actually is weighing down the mind. What are the activities of the mind that get involved with the pain in such a way as to bring the pain inside. Here again, the focus is on your present karma. But the meditation gives you the strength you need in order not to get overcome by the pain or feel threatened by the pain. It gives you the confidence so you can look into it. What is this pain? Why is it a problem? And where is the problem? As for not being overcome by pleasure, this is another one of the skills you learn as you meditate. You focus on the breath and a sense of ease comes up. And a lot of people go immediately for the ease and they drop the breath. They just want to wallow in that sensation of ease and milk what they can out of it. And it'll last for a little while, but then it goes. You learn instead. Let the ease do its work, whereas you continue doing your work with the breath. You focus on the breath, stay steadily with the breath, and then let the ease do its soothing in the body. You focus on the causes, the effects will take care of themselves. And this way you too learn how not to be overcome by pleasure. In fact, as you get deeper in the meditation, you realize that rapture and pleasure after all, it tend to get gross, and there's an even more refined state, which is just pure equanimity. And you learn to prefer that, so that way you're not overcome either by pleasure or pain. So what it comes down to is developing virtue, concentration, discernment. And then making your attitude of goodwill and equanimity as unlimited as you can. These are some of the things you have at your disposal. These are possibilities in the present moment. 
so you can respond to other people's hurtful actions and hurtful, hurtful words without being harmed. One, so that you don't respond with unskillful karma yourself and burden yourself with that new possession. And two, so you can maintain that state of mind that doesn't have to suffer in the face of pain. This is what equanimity means. It's not fatalistic, passive acceptance of things. It requires an understanding of karma, so you realize that you do have certain choices, things where you can make a difference. So you don't want to burden yourself by trying to push against things that you can't change. Look for your possibilities and your present choices, because that's where the freedom from suffering lies.